Good evening and welcome to Overtime here on WOTM. I'm Gerhard Mathangani. As you can see, we're joined by Mark Everett Kelly once again. It's a great day to have Mark in because it was the first round of the NCAA tournament is now done. The second round is now, for the most part, it's almost done. Almost, almost, done. almost completely done. We have kind of the rare games that we see here on a Monday. You normally see a, a Thursday, right. Saturday, and a Friday, Sunday situation. That way they're all over by Monday. But still some business to take care of in the NCAA tournament. And Mark's got a lot of great storylines that we'll hammer on and a lot of great and interesting insights as we go through those first two rounds. But first of all, Mark, your overall impressions. We'll start with the teams, the team that is in the state of Alabama in the tournament with the Alabama Crimson Tide. They've got one win already in the books, looking for another one against Maryland in the second round tonight to make it to the Sweet 16 for the first time mm. in many years. Your thoughts on what you saw Saturday from Bama in their first game in the SEC tournament or in the NCAA tournament in a while? But Usually with Alabama, what you notice is their defensive intensity, and that is always strong, and that's what, what got them the win on Saturday because Iona was the team with Patino. Patino is a, a coach that knows how to win. He's been there before. This guy, there's nothing he hasn't seen, and he had them really prepared because they defended the three pretty well against Alabama, so they weren't making the shots that they would normally make. The thing that I was a little disappointed in is that Alabama didn't pick up the pace a little right. because they didn't pick them up full court. They didn't force them to play a faster style. They kept the game in the 50s. If you notice, Iona kept, I, I kept the ball like for most of the shot clock, and they would just tick down the seconds, and that worked to their advantage because they don't want to play a fast game with Alabama. They can't keep up with their horses. So I thought that Oates would try to pressure them more, try to get them to shoot the ball quicker, and try to get them to play a little bit faster pace. They didn't do that. He kind of played right into their hands. But Patino, you know, he's an, an old fox. Mm -hmm. And I think he had these guys ready. And for most of the game, it looked like, you know, maybe the upset could be. I had people I was watching the game with, were like, where is Iona? Right. They don't know where it is. I'm like, yeah, it's up in New York State. It's right. in the MAC with two A's, uh -huh. not the MAC with one A, uh, the Metro Athletic uh, Conference. And they don't really have a, a successful history in the NCAA tournament. They haven't even won a game that wasn't vacated. Right. So, um, you know, watching them play and then uh, seeing how they advanced a little bit as the game got went on, they figured out how to penetrate and then kick the ball out because they had speed. And the one thing I didn't really like that, that Oates did, I thought it was, I thought he made adjustments later in the game, but I thought early on, Herb Jones isn't really a guy I would want to run the offense mm -hmm. half court, even though he can. That wasn't what Iona was uh, going to be beat at. Right. What worked later was when Quinn Early and some of the, 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 the faster guards were able to penetrate and then kick back out for three-pointers. Exactly. Uh, and then they got some open shots, and then they were able to really uh, use their offense and, uh, more efficiently, and that's kind of when the game uh, broke open a little bit in the second half. Right. For Alabama scoring just 68 points, that's a low total by their standards. They're a really good offensive team, one of the better offensive teams in the SEC. Mm -hmm. This is a few games now here you, dating back to the end of the regular season. They're on a seven-game winning streak, so the results say they're still winning the basketball games, and yeah. you pointed to the defense, with, which I think is a, a great part of that. Mm -hmm. But scoring 68 points and not having their best games in the SEC tournament, from a scoring perspective, right. they, they, they got into the 80s there in their first matchup. Is, this, is that concerning to you at all from uh, a fan's perspective maybe because we've seen Herbert Jones struggle from behind the arc. We've seen John Petty struggle from just about everywhere. Yeah, uh, unbelievable. Including on the, uh, on the free throw line. Mm -hmm. Is this cause for concern for Alabama or do you think that they can, Maryland starting today, and then if they're able to get past Maryland, will they be fine as they move forward? I think that Maryland's a better matchup for them. And then you look mm -hmm. at uh, a little bit step ahead, you have an 11 seed in the Sweet 16 in UCLA. Most people thought UCLA was going to bow out to Michigan State. Right. By the way, <laughs> we'll correct the, what the mistake we made last week, which was all my mistake, and I apologize for it. But anyway, uh, I think that that's an advantage for them. I think right. they match up better against Big Ten teams because they're, they're going to play more their style. Mm -hmm. Iona went into the game thinking that we're going to take Alabama out of their fast pace. So if they weren't making their shots, they weren't going to get as many of them. Alabama plays at a pace where usually you shoot the ball within the first 15 seconds of the shot clock. Right. Uh, Iona made them stop that. And I thought that they would try and force them to play faster, but they didn't but they still wind up winning. But Iona really doesn't have the talent level that a Maryland does, that a UCLA does, that a Florida State would, who, right. I'm, who I'm really scared of. And I do think that Michigan will lose to LSU as we're watching the game now. Uh, so I think that uh, Alabama, the better the teams are, Alabama, they, they, they're not going to try a trick and try to be cute with them. They're just going to come out and play. And Alabama has better athletes. They're better coached. They do a lot more things 
uh, efficiently than the other teams did, which is why they were so good this season. And I think Ocho is going to have them prepared uh, that better than he did against Iona, who's kind of like a, a, a wild card. You, you don't really prepare for the Ionas that much as you do for the Maryland or the UCLA's. Okay, exactly. And, and going back to Maryland for one second, they are coached by Mark Turgeon, who spent some time at Jacksonville State, yep. by the way. A lot of people might remember that name back in the late, sure. eight, late uh, 90s into the uh, early 2000s year. So it's good to see a, a guy with ties to the state of Alabama now playing Alabama to see if the Crimson Tide can get too. it rolling again. For sure. He won uh, the Big Ten Coach of the Year this year. Meanwhile, after the game on Saturday, both Herbert Jones and head coach Nate Oates talked about grading the performance against Iona. Herb Jones, his press conference came before Coach's press conference, mm -hmm. and they had a pretty interesting exchange <laughs> about the way they saw the way the Iona game graded out. Defensively, we didn't come out. I don't think we came out uh, how we should have, and we didn't we didn't make a lot of shots. But the effort was there. I give the effort an A. But I like our overall performance. I think it was a C. He's generous. I, I uh, C means average. It's definitely not our average. We, uh, you know, and again, Iona came with a great plan, did a good job. I mean, look, defensively. Give us a B. Offensively, we were probably a D, so maybe put the two of them together and maybe call the C. But, you know, defensively in the second half, we're pretty close to, you know, we're, we're really good. So Alabama on the men's side will take on Maryland coming up in their second round game. And as the basketball gods would have it, the Alabama women will do the exact same thing. The women got their first win today at the women's NCAA tournament this tournament going on over in San Antonio. Alabama struggled during the SEC part of the schedule, but they really bounced back towards the end of the year and got themselves in a position where they ended up winning the game. Once again, the first tournament win in 22 years. Bama the seventh seed, knocking off North Carolina the 10th seed, 80 to 71 in that matchup. They'll take on, like I said, Maryland, who knocked off Mount St. Mary's, the 15th seed out of that bracket. 98-45 this afternoon, so the second round game will take place coming up on Wednesday. So it'll be a busy week for Alabama basketball. You talk about their game Saturday, their game today, uh, and then their games games today, plural, and then their game coming up on Wednesday. I think for a lot of Alabama fans who might not have been paying attention to women's basketball because the program has been down, they have a lot to be cheering about today after the women got a big win today. Yeah, I mean, you want to see the women be successful because, you know, I, if, if you're going to be a big time school, which you know Alabama is, you want to see the boys and girls basketball teams uh, play very well. And uh, you saw th the difference with uh, the men's team this year. Right. So hopefully the women's team can meet um, their level and be more successful because there are more women that are really getting uh, to be great basketball players. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, they're, they're changing uh, their, their sport to where it's becoming a lot more exciting and a lot higher scoring. Exactly, and you're starting to see a lot more pace. It's a little bit what you see in the NBA. You're seeing yep. that play out in, in women's basketball as well. The shooting percentages have gone up from, from downtown, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and women have always been great free throw shooters oh, as yeah. well. I think their, their ability and to concentrate is, 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 from a media perspective, far outweighs them. Oh, and, and, and coaching. Co mm -hmm. I always uh, enjoyed coaching girls better because they listen. Right. And they break down the fundamentals, and mm -hmm. they ran the offense. They did everything to – yeah, exactly as I taught them to do. So I right. think there's more that they're willing to learn. And if you watch them, they execute excellently. Exactly. They really do. And they know how to dribble. They know how to pass the ball. They know how to set picks. All the things they do, it's, it's uh, really like a, a, a coaching clinic when you watch them, some of these girls play. Exactly. 80-71 to 71 was the final today in San Antonio. And Alabama was led by redshirt senior guard Jordan Lewis. Dropped a career-high 32 points in that one. Went 4 of 7 from downtown. Alabama gets the win, almost had a triple-double, Lewis did with 11 rebounds, also 8 assists. And both Lewis and head coach Christy Curry talked about the, not only the matchup, getting the win, making some Alabama history, and also moving forward. When I came to Alabama, I told Coach Curry that we were going to get back here on the big stage. And I think that we have worked so hard, and it was taken away last year. So I think when you get a moment like this, you can't miss an opportunity. You can't give an opportunity. So I think just all my teammates and me, like my teammates love me. They encourage me. They trust me. And so I think that's like the biggest motivation for me. Yeah, I definitely think there was nerves on both sides. Um, I think once you see the ball go through the hoop, your confidence raises. You know all the work that you've put in to get here. It's not easy to get here. And I think that our league has really prepared us for this. It's really tough to play in the SEC night in and night out. And so I think once you settle in, you just have to make shots like 
you have to be prepared and know that you've put all the work in and you put the shots up. So just keep shooting and keep attacking. Really proud of our team. You know, I thought Carolina did some amazing uh, runs at us and every time they'd run at us, you know, we would just step up and um, make a run of our own. And, you know, great point guard play, obviously an incredible, uh, every, the world saw today why um, Jordan Lewis is in my mind the best point guard um, in the SEC um, because she shares and cares and finds ways to impact us in so many different categories. So it's the Tide and the Terps on the men's side, the Tide and the Terps on the women's side. That game will once again be taking place on Wednesday, a time yet to be determined by the NCAA. Well, coming up next here on Overtime, we'll talk more NCAA action. We have some, some great nuggets from this tournament so far throughout the first round and a half here that Mark will share with us in our next segment. We talk Gonzaga and everything else from the tournament coming up next here on Overtime. We're back here on Overtime on WOTM. We continue our talk with the NCAA tournament. Mark, uh, it's been an incredible one so far. It started on Friday. I think most brackets are busted. I saw a report oh. from Bleacher Report. <laughs> most of the shreds. I think there was 0 0.4 brackets left out of like the 16 million that were filled that were still correct after like maybe 12 games. And then by the time Friday and, or Saturday wrapped up, there were no more brackets. And so, and you knew it was going to be this way. You knew it was going to be there was going to be madness, but I think that the madness that we saw it just ended up being insane. And, and you, you, we're, we'll take a lot, a lot of looks about how some of these things played out and how these things manifested. But I'm sure you're like me. Your bracket was probably done pretty early. Yeah, I mean, I look, I, I've, I've learned early on that the more I knew, the harder a time I had picking games. Right. I mean, when I knew all the teams in college basketball, when I was a college basketball researcher at ESPN, I used to stress, well, a 116 matchup. Well, if this team shoots well, you right. know, and they turn the ball over, like I could make an argument for anything. Yeah. So sometimes the more you know, it's not as good. But a funny story about in 2001 when Iowa State lost to Hampton, 215. Trey Wingo gets on the overhead to PA. Trey Wingo officially out of the ESPN bracket uh, contest. <laughs> 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 it, it was it, just absolutely hysterical. Trey was a funny guy, but that was one of the – Probably the biggest uh, surprises that I remember in NCAA tournament, almost like what we're going to see here coming exactly, up. Exactly, exactly. But there is one team that is still dancing, and it's the number one overall seed, and it's mm -hmm. the only team that is perfect in the tournament. That is the Gonzaga Bulldogs. They won their first round game, and then they came, to, came back today, won their second round game against Oklahoma. Uh, stay perfect on the year, and once again, the, the Bulldogs look to be the team. They have done so really since the season started. They look to be the team to beat in college basketball and they were that again today and they had some some really thing some great things that stood out in your mind yeah i i think gonzaga when you look at what they do gonzaga plays an excellent offense i mean they mm -hmm. are unstoppable on offense when people talk about them they actually get surprised if you hold them and and only if they only win by 10 10 right. points or less right like the last only one time this year they were won a game under 10 points that was against west virginia mm -hmm. every other game they won by at least 10 points and today they shoot 49 percent that's the lowest percentage they shot all all year right so i mean if they're playing that well all year and then they shoot 49 percent in the nca tournament game where they're still scoring over 90 points against oklahoma who oklahoma, we know how good oklahoma is they beat mm -hmm. alabama during the regular mm -hmm. season that's right and gonzaga just being you know, pretty much toyed with them all game i mean oklahoma stayed in the game they kept it within 10 points you, you might have for a second, maybe had a, a, a brow of sweat drop off you, maybe, mm -hmm. if you were a uh, Gonzaga, but for the most part, they, they knew what they were doing. They had the game in charge. And, uh, and this guy, Richard Tim, uh, excuse me, uh, Drew Tim, this guy just went off. Only the third player in Gonzaga history to have a 30 point game in the NCAA tournament. Richie Fram and Adam Morris, I don't know if you remember Adam Morris. Oh, yeah. Adam Morris was a guy they thought was going to be Larry Bird, mm -hmm. and they lost that absolute heartbreaker to UCLA in 2006 where they blew a big lead. With a minute left, uh, Gus Johnson refers to it as Heartbreak City in NCAA yeah. tournament history, one yeah. of the great calls ever. Yeah. Um, so those types of things can happen to Gonzaga. Hopefully this year, if you're a uh, Gonzaga fan out there in Spokane, Washington, that you'll get to see them uh, get to the final. They've only did that once, despite all the, the years that they've been one of the better teams in the tournament. Exactly. We'll, we'll take a look at some of the, the things that you spotlighted out. They reached Sweet 16 now for the sixth consecutive year we'll also put that in perspective in just a bit they also are now 28 and 0 on the season and what I found probably one of the most impressive statistics this is the 25th straight victory in double digits mm -hmm. kind of showing their dominance right now 
not only in league play, but now also in tournament play. And the guy you talked about earlier, D Drew Tim, with that career high 30 points, also tied a career high with those 13 rebounds. And another thing that, that you uh, mentioned here is they now have, with this Sweet 16 tournament appearance, they're now kind of climbing up the, the ranks as far as consecutive tournament appearances in NCAA history. That number led by North Carolina, who did it back in the 1980s to the early 90s to 1993. Also Duke a couple of times and Gonzaga right now, as you said, on a nice little run here with consecutive, most consecutive Sweet 16 appearances. Yeah, well, look, but, but really, uh, if I'm at Gonzaga, who I feel bad for is Dan Monsoon. I don't know if you remember Dan Monsoon. Yeah. He was a coach in 1999 when they made their first NCAA tournament appearance. Now they have, what, 20? They've made the NCAA tournament every year, and Mark Few has been the benefit a factor of that. Right. Uh, Monsoon is a guy who wound up going to, what, Minnesota. Now he's, at, I mean, now he's out in Long Beach State, so maybe he's not as bad as everyone <laughs> thinks, sitting on the life. beach and having Mai Tais. Right. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, he was a guy that was turned the whole program around. They got to the Sweet 16. Uh, back in 1999, they, all of a sudden, they, you know, before that, Gonzaga was known for John Stockton. Mm -hmm. And I got relatives up there in Spokane, so I knew about it, but not too many other uh, people had heard about it. They put Gonzaga on the map. They were one of the best uh, teams in college basketball going over the last 20 years. You know what they represent. You know what Mark Few represents. You know what you're going to get when you send your kid there. They're going to be well-schooled. They're going to do a lot of things. Uh, you know, very well shooting, and uh, they're going to know the fundamentals extremely well, which is why Gonzaga consistently wins exactly. in the NCAA tournament. Exactly, and then we'll take a look at some more of their success in the NCAA tournament. The good thing is that they're consistent and they make it there. The kind yep. of not good thing is they still haven't won the ultimate crown as of yet, still sure. chasing that championship. We'll take a look at what they've done here over the recent past. Going into this season, obviously, we do not know the result. But, however, the 2019 season, 33-4, and four, lost in the Elite Eight. Also lost in the National Championship back in 2017. Mm -hmm. Lost in the second round in 2013. I, I, I found your, your takeaway of what Gonzaga's been able to do kind of impressive. It's impressive in one lane. Yeah. However, in another lane, it shows that they still had to get it done and get the ring. Right, but you look at some of the other coaches. I mean, Coach K was an annual Final Four loser. Right. You know, he lost in 86, he lost in 88, lost in 89, got absolutely blown out by UNLV by 30 in the NCAA championship game in 1990, mm -hmm. and then he comes back and he wins it in 91. Roy Williams was a guy who perennially, uh, you wondered when his time was going to come before he won. Right. Uh, uh, he won his first championship. Jim Beheim, another guy. Took until you know Carmelo got there to finally win, and we both know how old Bayheim is. Yeah, exactly. Started coaching when I was two, for <laughs> crying out loud. And he's got Syracuse back in the Sweet Sixteen. Yeah, so I mean, sometimes you just need to pay your dues a little bit. And Mark Few has been a great coach. You can look at Roy Williams, Jim Bayheim, Mike uh, Shushevsky, and say, you know what? I'm not the only coach that's gotten there and hasn't won right away. Even John Wooden didn't win right away at UCLA. Mm -hmm. He had to be there a couple years. Yeah, and he wanted to win, you know, 10 and 12. But hey, you know, sometimes you need the players. But he's got the players. I think this year is like kind of like, remember when Kentucky was undefeated a couple years ago? Everybody yes. thought they, they were going to, but they didn't. They wound right. up losing to Wisconsin. Right. Um, and Cal Perry, another guy. Mm -hmm. When is he going to win? Right. Yeah, like great teams. You know, that Memphis team that should have won against Kansas right. and blew so it. Had Derrick Rose on that team. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of those things, as you're a coach, you have gone through that. So Gonzaga is really no different than anybody else. Yeah, exactly. We were rolling. We were rolling. Come on, you're <laughs> killing us here. So, so live text started, stopped, uh, or not live text, but the live view unit. So what uh, the live view did? Say what? Bama. Bama's down. All right. Let's go. What's that? Bama's down 11 7. It's early. Uh, what about Michigan's old what? 
Oh, man. Mm. Uh, I might be able to close it out. LSU goes into the, they, they just, like, they're so hard to diagnose, man. They, mm -hmm. they got mental problems. Every And every now and again, they'll look like just. Oh, they look great. They'll, they'll look, yeah, like a machine. Yeah, and then they'll wonder look like Eli Manning. Exactly. You know, when Eli's bad. I uh, <laughs> wonder what trend has got. He's f yeah, Watford's 4 of 11, 0 of 1 from 3, 3 of 8, 3 pointers. He's not having a good game. What about the kid from around here? That's, that's him, Trenton oh. Watford. Um, He's the kid that went to Mountain Brook. And uh, what the freshman? 25? Uh, was that, was that uh, Hyatt? No. Uh, Thomas. Thomas, he got 20, 26? Yeah, 26, 9 of 20. Hit three three-pointers. And the smart kid's got 25. Yeah. What, what, what does Michigan shoot from the field? Because uh, if, if they let's see. That's yeah, why I... They're at 52%. Yeah. yeah. That's why I don't like Wade. Yeah. He's a cheater anyway. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, and 9 of 24 from 3. Yeah, the 2005, 2006 um, Gonzaga team, I thought they were going to go to the Final Four. They lost to UCLA in a game mm -hmm. where they blew it late. Right. Da Darren Collison and uh, one of the other guys, uh, Alf, starts with an A, wound up playing in the NBA for a bunch of years, hit a, hit a big three. Yeah. Because um, um, that Kansas team was really good. Uh. They went to, that was Ben Holland, they went to the Final Four three straight years. They didn't was win it. Holland was coaching that team? Uh, Aaron Ofalo. Yeah. Ofalo, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Holland coached yeah, at UCLA, yeah. Yeah. Jordan Farmore, that was. Uh, oh, that's right, yeah. I remember then that. Then Russell Westbrook came after that. Mm -hmm. Man, uh, how awesome. Those guys. Every year with those guys. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Kevin, then, yeah, Kevin Love was. Cedric Bozeman, Ryan Holland was good, Darren Collison. Mm -hmm. um, and these, you know, Jordan Farmore was a good, a good uh, drafted by the Lakers. Yep. M ba Amute. <laughs> Richard yeah. Ba Amute. Yeah, yeah. yep, yep. Heartbreak City. Um, the only way I know how to probably to do it, I, the well, there's there's a probably easier way. Can you see how long segment one was? And just do the just do the math backwards. Okay. You said 34? <laughs> Welcome back to Overtime here on WOTM. Here in this next segment, we'll talk more about the NCAA tournament. Mark, it's been a crazy tournament. We've seen a bunch of upsets, and I don't know about your bracket, but mine was essentially in the trash before – uh, I would say the tenth game started, especially after Ohio State uh, went down. I'm pretty sure your bracket's in the exact same yeah. position. Yeah, I mean it's funny how they say, "Oh, if you can pick the brackets, the guy who has a perfect bracket, nobody can pick a perfect bracket." Right? How can you know these things are going to happen? Uh, I, I told you a story where when I was at ESPN, I would have a hard time. When I, the more I knew, I would have a hard time trying to figure out. Okay, I thought maybe a 16 could beat a one because right. I knew the players really well. I knew what they did offensively. Well, if you turn the ball over, you never know. So I would torment myself back when I really knew the teams. Now it's, you know, who cares? You kind of just go through it. Um, I don't know as much as I did back then when I had to know everything about everything, when you're working with Jay Billis and Digger Phelps and those right. guys. Uh, but to tell you a, a funny story, Trey Wingo, 2001, when I, Iowa State as a two seed loses to Hampton, mm -hmm. gets on the PA. Trey Wingo officially out of the ESPN <laughs> bracket. It, it was absolutely hysterical. <laughs> Because everybody there just sat there shocked that Iowa State lost to a, a 15 seed. Exactly. And we had another one of those shockers in this tournament as well. We'll get to that in, in a bit. But first, the number one team overall is still dancing. That mm -hmm. is the Gonzaga Bulldogs. And they ended up getting a win today over Oklahoma in a big game. Gonzaga is the team that I think everybody, they're pr the prohibitive favorite as far as Vegas is concerned. And I think as far as most brackets go, most teams or most people think that this team can get it done by virtue of what they did in the regular season. They are still undefeated on the year at 28-0. They looked good today, especially late in the first half, early second half. 
and they were able to pick away uh, at a big win there. What were some of your takeaways from the Bulldogs? Well, the Bulldogs, they play efficient offense. I mean, they never really seem to miss shots. Mm -hmm. I mean, they shot 49% today. That was their worst shooting percentage of the season. Right. Uh, they, when they don't win by 10 points, it's an odd occasion. Uh, their only game they lost by, by less than 10 points was against West Virginia earlier in the year. People thought Iowa might be able to give them the game. Bye-bye to that because right. Iowa couldn't uh, stop Oregon all game. So imagine if they couldn't stop Oregon, mm -hmm. they were – Gonzaga might have scored 200 exactly. against them yeah. because they just uh, operate so well offensively. Uh, Drew Tim, one of the guys who really stands out for this team, a guy like in the mold of Adam Morrison and Richie Fram, who are uh, the only other Gonzaga Bulldogs to score over 30 points in an NGA tournament game. Uh, Tim is the first one to have a double-double with 30 points and 10 rebounds. Uh, Dan Dickow is also another guy. He had 29 points. So those four are legends mm -hmm. in Gonzaga. Um, and the, the other thing about that is the three of those four games happened on March 16th. So they all happen on the same day except for this one. Right. So I thought that was interesting. But you look at what they do well. They execute well offensively. They're not going to make mistakes. They're not going to beat themselves. They're not going to turn the ball over. They're not going to make stupid plays. Mark Few has done an excellent job. Like I was telling you before, the guy I really feel bad for is Dan Monsoon, mm -hmm. who was there in 1999, the first year when nobody knew who Gonzaga was. Right. They had no idea in the country where it was. It's out there in Spokane, Washington. Uh, they got a prep school that was probably more popular than mm -hmm. in college. Right. The only thing people knew was, guns, uh, was, uh, was John Stockton graduated from there. Right. And now you look at it, they're on an incredible run of success in the NCAA tournament. They're one of the best teams consistently over the last 20 years. In, the, um, in, in college basketball, and that's because of Mark Few, the way that they recruit, the players they get in, the system they run. All the players know what they're going to do. They know how to do it. They know they don't go beyond their limitations, um, and that's why they win these games. Exactly. Let's take a look at some of the, your takeaways from Gonzaga this year. The number one overall seed now reaches the Sweet 16 for the sixth consecutive time. That ties the 1975-80 to 80 UCLA Bruins fourth longest streak in NCAA tournament history. This year, 28 and 0, still unblemished. What I find probably the most impressive, 25 mm -hmm. straight wins and double digits. Drew Tim, as you mentioned earlier, that career high 30 points and also mm -hmm. tied a career high with those 13 rebounds as well. This also now marks, as you talked about, the a consecutive Sweet 16 appearances. Now, once again, they are now joining very, very good company. You talk about the likes of North Carolina and Duke and now Gonzaga finds themselves in that territory as well, the most consecutive Sweet 16 tournament appearances. We'll take a look at that. North Carolina with 13 overall, followed by Duke, who did it twice in two different yep. decades, and Gonzaga right there along with it, as now we sit currently after that win today. Uh, yeah, and so you see Gonzaga, they just represent consistency. You get to six straight Sweet 16s in this age where you have to recruit every year, mm -hmm. you know, where you have, now you had COVID. I mean, they didn't seem to miss a beat. These guys are stronger than ever. Uh, and the way they're executing offensively, uh, they look stronger than any team that I can remember, uh, say, the last 10 years. I thought Kentucky was absolutely dominant that year. Right. Everybody thought they were going to go undefeated. They didn't. They wound up losing to Wisconsin. Um, so I, I think, we, you know, Mark Few, even though he hasn't won the NCAA tournament yet, I think this obviously is his best shot. Exactly. And you mentioned they haven't won it yet. They've been very, very, very close. So take a look at how close they have been in recent years because the, the consistency of success doesn't always relate to winning the ultimate crown. They haven't had the ring just yet, but they have been close in recent history. 2021, we don't know where this season will end. Mm -hmm. Still got the question mark there. However, those other years with 30 plus victories, lost in the Elite Eight, national championship game and also in the second round do you feel like this is the year that they can put it all together and come away with the ring I, I do I think they're the best team I think they're the best offense I think maybe Baylor can give them a game offensively maybe maybe Alabama can really force them out of their game with the way they play defense right. that's going to be a great game if they get to play each other I would love to see that one and another year that's not on here is 2005 2006 29 and 4 with Adam Morrison lost a, a heartbreaker to UCLA Gus Johnson calls it heartbreak city we right? They blew a late lead. Uh, UCLA turned them over a couple times. That was when uh, UCLA went to the Final Four three straight years. So a great UCLA team by uh, Ben Howland. Uh, so they've had some bad luck in the NCAA tournament. Sometimes you don't, you know, you, you operate in bad luck. Coach K, 86 made it to the Final Four, 88 made it to the Final Four, 89 made it to the Final Four, 1990 made it to the Final Four. Didn't win any of those years. Got blown out in 90 by UCLA. Roy Williams took a long time. Before he finally won there, never won in Kansas. Number one seed in 1997 loses to Miles Simon in Arizona. Everybody was shocked. Right. 
Uh, he finally wins when he comes to North Carolina. Jim Beheim, another guy. In 1987 with great players, Ronnie Cycli, Sherman Douglas, uh, Derek Coleman, never wins. Then finally with Carmelo gets there in 2003, and he beats Roy Williams. Exactly. So uh, sometimes it takes you a while right. to get there. Great coaches, they don't figure it out right away. Not because they don't have the talent. Cal Perry, another guy, blew a game. Uh, with Memphis, didn't wind up winning with Kentucky, didn't win the year everyone thought he would. Sometimes it doesn't happen that way. If you keep sad, he's, he's going to win a championship eventually. Exactly. So we'll go from the, the top seed, the overall number one seed in the tournament, to the now the new darlings. Nobody or very few people heard of Earl Ro Oral yeah. Roberts about two weeks ago. Everybody's filling their bracket out, and you obviously we automatically <laughs> you just go to Ohio State on that second line. But no, 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 Oral Roberts has different plans in mind, knocked out Ohio State in the first round. Now they find themselves in the Sweet 16 after beating Florida. You, you talk about the history that they made and the history of this, of this program. It's one now where they're turning some heads because they've done so in a tight game, one that went to overtime against Ohio State that they won, and then shot the lights out in a really good game against Florida yesterday. Your thoughts on Oral Roberts, kind of the, the new darlings of the tournament, the 15 seed in the Sweet 16? I thought they, they, they really shined against uh, Florida. Obviously, late in the game, they were down a little bit. They were down by like seven points. They were able to hit big shots at big moments. Something these kids, you figure th they might fall. They're not right. used to playing in the spotlight. But those guys, they remind me a lot of Florida Gulf Coast, which was the other 15 seed mm -hmm. to advance to the Sweet 16. If you remember them, they were dunking and throwing down dunks on people right. and absolutely like, who are these guys? Exactly. Um, look, Ohio State's good, okay? Mm -hmm. They didn't really force the ball inside enough. They dominated them inside, but they didn't really do that enough. They shot the ball well from three-point range, but Oral Roberts got a couple players, man, that they just, these guys don't miss. They perform well under pressure. Uh, and they're right where they want to be. These guys are dangerous as a 15th seed. They've already beaten two very good teams That's in right. Florida who played a great first-round game against Virginia mm -hmm. Tech, where if Florida wasn't mentally tough, they would have bowed out of there because Virginia Tech really had lost that game three or four times yeah, exactly. before hitting a three at the buzzer to tie it. So you knew Florida was mentally tough, or Roberts hung in there when they were down, came back to win that game, and being a two-seed in Ohio State, um, it's so rare but they were able to do it, and uh, again, the second 15 seed in NCAA tournament history to make it to the Sweet 16. Exactly, and we'll take a look at how the Golden Eagles got it done in the company that they now join as 15 seeds that knocked out number two seeds in that first round, and they were able to do so joining some of the, some of the great memories that we've had of years past. You think about that Middle Tennessee State uh, team that kind of captured America's heart. So, same thing with the Florida Gulf Coast team. That team that dunked the ball everywhere and oh, they awesome. made a nice run as well back in 2013 against uh, Georgetown. Also Norfolk State back in 2012. There was two of them there in that yeah, 2012 Lehigh, season. Because yeah. also the Lehigh team that shot Beat Duke. Duke. Exactly. Always and, and great when Duke loses early. Always, <laughs> for the most part, a lot of people in college basketball share that exact <laughs> same assessment. Hampton over Iowa State. A game that it was back in 1997. Coppin State, shout out, that's my dad's alma mater, by the way, a very small school, we're kind of in the uh, Baltimore area, beating South Carolina. I remember that game well as a oh, youngster. Yeah. Two, and, two, two straight years, exactly. Eddie Fogel lost as a two and a three seed yes, in the first round. Exactly. And uh, South Santa Clara over Arizona, Richmond over Syracuse. So, once again, Oral Roberts, not only this is the 15 seed beating the two seed, but they took it one step further and they're now in the Sweet 16, which is even more impressive in that regard. Meanwhile, the top 16 seeds we talked about earlier, we talked about this as the tournament led up. Mm -hmm. You looked at the number one through four seeds in each region. These are your top 16 teams. Mm -hmm. Well, as we sit here a few, uh, a round and a half into this tournament, we now have half of those teams will do the same thing as we're doing, watching this tournament from home and joining the likes of a lot of the teams out of the Big Ten as well. I, I think this is really interesting, the teams that are already eliminated. Uh, well, I mean, Houston was, as a two-seed, came close to losing yesterday as well. They, right. they played great down the stretch uh, and held on to win that game. Alabama's the other number two seed. You know, hopefully we expect them to win tonight against Maryland. Uh, you have some of these. Some of these are just flat-out surprises. Texas losing to Alba, Alba and Chris. I don't think anybody expected that. Right. Texas finally kind of broke through and won their conference tournament for the first time. And Texas is kind of known for, you know, letting people down, letting their fans down in the NCAA tournament. Right. Uh, which, we used to call it the Rick Barnes syndrome. Uh -huh. And if you're a Tennessee fan, you know what I'm talking right, about. Right. Okay. Uh, but now he's not there anymore. He's not there to kind of poison everything. So, and they're still losing in the first round. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not good. West Virginia, you know, sometimes you, you, you don't play well. A uh, team plays better than you. Uh, Oregon State, 
um, was pretty good. Right, um, exactly. So, uh, you know, that, that's why they lost. Uh, exactly. P Purdue, again, Purdue uh, ran into a, they just couldn't shoot the ball. Yeah, couldn't yeah. shoot the ball. Same thing with Virginia, couldn't shoot the ball. Mm -hmm. They had a other problem with, uh, with COVID. So there are a lot of things working against, uh, against some of these teams. Yeah, the top eight teams, the top 16 teams, they're now dwindling down. And well, another big storyline, the one that, that you pointed out, I think beautifully, is that the, the team, the conference that was considered the best going into this is the Big Ten. Yep. And the Big Ten has really struggled in this tournament. You talk about by far and away the most teams into the tournament, nine. Of the nine, mm -hmm. two are alive. And, and as you said, both Michigan and Maryland, Maryland can go home tonight. And Michigan, if they can close out against LSU, they could be the only team left standing with no guarantees because they might have to play Alabama a little bit later as well. How shocked are you that the Big Ten, with all the hype and all the clout coming into this big dance, has now essentially had a really, really tough run? Well, I think they kind of beat each other up all year. That's true. You know, so you're in a conference where you're playing against teams that you know very well. You're going to have close games. These guys are probably all exhausted. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they play a physical brand of basketball in the Big Ten. So, look, I thought Michigan was the most susceptible to lose, and I thought LSU was going to beat them, and it looked like they, they could have for most of that game, but they didn't. Um, I, I didn't think Illinois was going to lose to Loyola, uh, but Loyola has kind of a weird history of success in the NCAA tournament. It's right. the third time they made it to the Sweet 16, and they've only been in like four NCAA mm -hmm. tournaments. So uh, Michigan State was, you know, a, a team that we didn't even have in because I didn't watch the, the bracket show and I thought that they had uh, lost because they were 9-11 in the conference and usually a 9-11 conference team barely makes the NCAA tournament right. uh, because also Maryland 9-11 in the conference, they made the tournament. Thought they would take one of the two, they wound up taking both of them. Uh, but Maryland's a good team too. I mean, you saw them dominate UConn, mm -hmm. okay? And they'll, they'll give Alabama a game because they play well defensively and they got a couple guys that can shoot the threes. So uh, it's a very tough conference, even Rutgers. That was a great game yesterday against Houston. Rutgers could have easily beat them. Rutgers was kind of like a joke. Right. In the Northeast, we call mm -hmm. them Sunge. State <laughs> University in New Jersey. Right. Um, that doesn't really represent anything uh, noble because it's in the middle of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I thought that they played extremely well. I still can't believe they're in the Big Ten, but they played extremely well against Houston. Wisconsin beat North Carolina only the second time that North Carolina lost in the first round, first round yeah. in uh, like the last 25 years. Exactly, 31 and two, I think is the number yeah. that, that, that you provided earlier. So the Big Ten is struggling, but there are conferences that are doing pretty well. After looking at the, as, as the first round and a half and the second round starts to close up here, you take a look at the major conferences mm. and the, mm. the, obviously the Big Ten has struggled mightily, especially in the second round. But you take a look at uh, like a conference like the Pac-12. I know, I can't that believe that. That is obviously off to a great start here. I can't believe it. This just reminds you of like the Vegas betting board because it's kind of like should be constantly changing as the right. games are, are ending. But look, the Pac-12, UCLA, Colorado, uh, USC, uh, who plays later today, uh, these, these teams have played very well. And I think Pac-12 overall kind of gets a little laughed at. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe in college football, they don't hold them as seriously as the SEC or the right. Big Ten or the Big 12. So this is their time to kind of step up and say, we're still out here in California. Uh, we don't just sit on the beach all day. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, leading the charge, another team that's in the Sweet 16 is UCLA. And, and Bill Walt would be proud. Exactly. Most most definitely. And and then you see the struggles for some of the other teams. And, uh, that's awful. And, 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 and the Big 12 is also struggling as well. We'll see if the SEC can continue to, to keep pace with both Arkansas and Alabama still in the fold there. Another thing that you, you looked up and I thought was really interesting is that we have a lot of double digit seeds mm -hmm. making it to the Sweet 16. And this is kind of rivaling what we have seen before in the past. And by the end, by what, when it's all said and done, we could have even more, we could have probably a historic number of teams that make it to the, the second weekend. Well, now you have uh, a two 11s, a 12, and a 15. That's right. Okay, uh, the record, obviously, in 1999, but three of them were 10 seeds. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's no 10 seeds uh, in this group. Uh, uh, 2011, there were no 10 seeds either. So, uh, you still, Maryland might be the first 10 seed. They're the only team that could make uh, the only double-digit seed left. Exactly. That could push that to five and then tie 1999. Uh, but just the fact that you have a 15 in the Sweet 16 for right. only the second mm -hmm. time, uh, uh, just, you know, and, and a 12 in Oregon State, who I think is very, very good. Right. Um, look, uh, this, this year shows that uh, there were teams that were underrated, right. uh, right. especially in the Pac-12. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, you looked at that Pac-12 tournament, um, Oregon, Oregon State, 
uh, Colorado, those, those teams can play. Exactly. Uh, and they came to play so far uh, in this year in the NCAA tournament. They have not lost any games. Exactly. It's been a, a crazy time in the bubble, and I thought that one of two things would happen. It would either go primarily chalk, or we would see a lot of chaos. Turns out the latter is what has gone on here. Well, that is it for our basketball talk, but coming up next here, we'll talk some football. There's some in-season football, some postseason, out-of-season football. We'll talk both coming up next year on Overtime. Welcome back to Overtime here on WOT, and we shift gears now to football. We'll start with in-season football, as weird as it is here in the spring, hmm. but Jacksonville State once again getting a big win at home and sliding up in the polls. We'll talk about that in a second. JSU now 7-1 and one overall. They got a big 21-3 win over SEMO. They stay perfect in spring football. They're now 4-0 in the spring, and it's also the 400th game at historic Burgess Snow Field. And I'll tell you what, Mark, for, for those that like football, this team has really given them something to be excited about. I know we're smashed right now in the middle of the NCAA tournament, but a nice crowd out at Burgess Snow Field for the 400th game. And, and Jacksonville State, once again, putting up another win and now 4-0 in the spring part of the year, 7-1 mm -hmm. and one overall. They're trying to make themselves look like they can win a national championship. Yeah, they got the longest winning streak in the FCS. Their defense, which you, you noted, has been played. They've stopped the run. Uh, excellent. Yeah, you can't run on them. You mm -hmm. can't run on a team that takes away a lot of what you want to do uh, in this type of football. Exactly, and, and they're – a team that gave up just nine rushing yards to SEMO, and you see even in the highlights how fast they are to the football. They have they a are. very young defensive line, a couple freshmen, true freshmen on that defensive line. Jalen Swain is one of them having a, fen a phenomenal year. Uh, a healthy group of linebackers, and that's been important because health has been an issue for members of this defense as they mm -hmm. have gone on into the year. So JSU got the win on Saturday. The final score in that one was 21-3 to over SEMO. And again, they stay undefeated in conference play here in the spring season. Head coach John Gross changed up his weekly press conference. He held his today and really talked about the effort from his guys that came to work on Saturday, on Sunday and got the big win to keep them perfect on the season here in the spring. Yeah, I slept really good last night. So it was uh, just a good, solid home win. You know, I thought today was a beautiful day for football. We had a really good crowd. Uh, you know, we even had our student section had some folks in it and I was worried about that had playing two home games on on both ends of spring break I was concerned about our students so we had several of those that hung around came to the game I think we'll have more next week to, as well so just uh, like I said good day overall I mean I think we come out pretty pretty clean injury wise which is a positive so hopefully just uh, continue to get better so Jacksonville State now continuing to climb in the national rankings according to the stats poll that was released this morning JSU now up to number seven. You see the seven and one overall, four and zero oh in the OVC. You have some of your your normal, your usual suspects. James Madison at number one, North Dakota State there at number two. You see a lot of teams out of the Missouri Valley Conference, and it shows how strong that that conference is. But I tell you what, Mark, JSU really, I think what they're doing on the field, especially both on offense and on defense, really kind of finding their groove both ways. That they're they're getting some of the national attention here. As, as we creep closer and closer to the playoffs. They got a lot of team speed. Mm -hmm. They are very fast. You're very fast on defense. You're going to create havoc and matchup problems. Mm -hmm. Same thing with on, on offense. And it, uh, I think another thing that is going to help them is they play more games. That's right. So they have uh, a little more experience this season. Mm -hmm. And also you have to count their games going back. Last year when they played four games in the non-conference, the only loss they have is to Florida, Florida State, State down, yeah. in, down in Tallahassee. That was a great game was. as well. And they also – Knocked off of FIU, which is a team that's out of the FBS. But also there's other three other teams around the state of Alabama that compete on the FCS level. Along with Jacksonville State, you also have Alabama State. They're coming off a nice win. They beat Jackson State. That team is coached very famously by Deion Sanders. 35-28, the final score there. Next up, they'll have Arkansas Pine Bluff coming up this Saturday at 6 o'clock. Also, Alabama A&M, they remain undefeated. They're still 2-0. Their previous game this past week at uh, Prairie View, Prairie View A&M over in Texas was postponed. Next up, Grambling State. You know their history. Saturday at 1 o'clock. Also, Sanford now 2-3. and three. They're playing a very, very tough schedule right now. Lost to VMI, 38-37, a heartbreaker in overtime. But next up, they'll travel to South Carolina and take on the Citadel. That game is coming up this Saturday at noon. So, JSU kind of leading the charge here for the state of Alabama. 
but the three other teams also playing well as we wind up the regular season in FCS football. Meanwhile, in FBS football, Alabama, of course, the defending national champions looking to make it back to back. They're also holding a pro day for their guys that helped them win the national championship. Now looking for jobs in the NFL. We'll talk about both coming up next with the tie here on Overtime. We're back here on Overtime on WOTM. Mark, let's go to the FBS level. Of course, Alabama played a full regular season last year, won a national championship. A lot of those players are now up for the NFL draft, and a lot of those players can, will be making a whole lot of money here pretty soon for themselves and for their family, and also be a good representation for the University of Alabama. Your thoughts overall on this upcoming draft, lots of these big-time names that helped them win a national championship mm -hmm. are now on the draft board, of course, led by the Heisman Trophy winner, Devontae Smith. Yeah, I, I think you yeah, have the record for the most first round picked by uh, a single team in a single year was back in 2004. University of Miami had six guys taken in the first round. Mm -hmm. I think I think that Alabama can beat that. Uh, you look at the fact that if Alex, uh, if Landon Dickerson didn't get hurt, he probably would have been a first round pick. Right. The guy that really uh, took over the center position. And you saw how much everybody mm -hmm. loved him on the mm -hmm. team when he, uh, he got hurt uh, and they kind of ran out there and the whole team kind of um, was with him for that. So Moses, another guy before his injury, was definitely a first-round pick. Uh, Leatherwood, a great offensive lineman. All these guys uh, could be first-round picks. There's only you know 30-something teams though, right. uh, and not everybody has the needs for offensive linemen like some teams do. But uh, Devonta Smith, Mac Jones, Patrick Sertan, Jalen Waddle, Najee Harris, these are all going to be superstars at the next level. Exactly. Obviously led by Devonta Smith. And, and he's one of the guys that when you, you take a look at the college football landscape, he, he's so different mm -hmm. because he's oh. not a burner. He's not the outside guy as a burner. He's not the inside guy. He is the best route runner, right. though, in he this, has in this speed. league. Exactly. He's like Jerry Rice speed. Exactly. You know, Jerry Rice speed, you, you would say, that guy's not fast, and then he's running right by you for touchdowns. Right, and and obviously he, he shook up the world last year with his, his incredible season and then winning the Heisman Trophy. Uh, Mac Jones was a Heisman Trophy finalist as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, y these these players have built up that equity, but you, you take a look at Devontae Smith, Mac Jones, Patrick Sertan, Jalen Waddle, Najee Harris, all expected to be, if not first round, yeah. but kind of close there to that first round. But then you also have Christian Barmore, who had a great yep. uh, a little young, end of but the yeah, season right. right on the defensive line. Also, Alex Otherwood, as you mentioned, and, and Dylan Moses as well. Would I think for you, do you think that uh, Devontae Smith's success can be as dynamic as it was at the University of Alabama on the next level, or do you kind of see him being as a – as an, as an everyday wide receiver for, for whatever franchise drafts him? I think it depends who, who drafts him. Look, I think he can be outstanding uh, if he gets drafted into the right system. Uh, one that's going to get him in ball pretty consistently, one that's going to uh, put him and spread him out in different spots on the field. He can play in, in the slot. He can play out wide. Uh, he's going to be good no matter what because he's a guy that works hard. He practices really hard. He came back this year when he didn't have to. He would have been a first-round draft right. pick last year. Uh, he was a guy that caught the, the game-winning uh, touchdown in the national championship as a freshman. Mm -hmm. So he's already accomplished a lot. And last year, when everybody knew who was getting the ball, he absolutely dominated. And in the first half, 12 catches, 215 yards against a very good you know, Ohio State team. And exactly. everybody knew he was mm -hmm. getting the ball. Mm -hmm. So he can do it against good teams. He can do it when you know it's coming his way. Um, and he can do it against good defensive backs because some of those guys could play. He made them all look like fools. That's because he runs very good routes, and he has that deceptive speed. You look at him, he's not really that big. He's kind of lanky. He can jump out of the building. Right. He never drops a ball, uh, and he can do, like you see him here, returning punts. He's a guy that can do so many different things. You can line him up and hand him, hand him the ball for a handoff. There are a lot of different things he brings to an offense that I think are really is really unique. That's why I see him succeeding. Um, Najee Harris is a guy who has – the best feet of any running back I've seen are running inside the tackles right. since Emmitt Smith. Exactly, and he's also got some ha great hands, too, and I know he wants to be able to use that on the next level to make himself a little bit more money. All The pros, scouts, and the teams will all be in Tuscaloosa today as they hold Pro Day tomorrow. Meanwhile, the prospects are also in. Devontae Smith and Deontay Brown met the media today to talk about what they perceive for themselves on the next level and what they're trying to show scouts that they're ready for in the NFL. I feel like it's not going to be no different than college. I mean, I play against some of the best in college. I mean, I played in the SEC. I feel like it's the toughest conference it is. So, I mean, like, I know a lot of people that's bigger than me that have more problems than me, so I'm not worried about it at all. I think being around him with not just me, but everybody, when you come to a place like this, um, 
the people that's ahead of you, you just you you kind of look up to them and you just try to soak in everything that they're doing. So me just watching the older guys from when I first got here, just watching the things that they did and just soaking in the things that they were teaching me and just getting better every day. So I mean, it was good coming here, having those guys ahead of me and just being able to learn from them. I hope it showed them that that I can I can pass block. I mean. Uh, it speaks for itself. Um, not giving them a sack in, in three and a half years. Uh, I think that that's a really good thing, especially in the SEC, where uh, most of the defense linemen are really dominant. Um, and also for me, being an arguably bigger guy, uh, that is a great stat for me because it proves that I can I can move in space and that I can handle my own. We'll see how they do in the draft. Meanwhile, Alabama's current football team going through spring practice. This is video of their practice today. This is day two of spring practice. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more on the Crimson Tide as, as they go throughout practice. And a lot of this right now is kind of learning and the installation. There's not really a whole lot of news coming out of Tuscaloosa right now. What are some of the things that you are looking for for this Crimson Tide football team as they now mm -hmm. move forward without Mac Jones, without Devontae, without a lot of these senior leaders that we're talking about going to the NFL? I just love the way Saban looks in his straw, in his straw hat. That name is great. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a staple. I, I, I think that you can't expect them to put up the offensive fire, uh, you know, dynamic numbers that they've done the last three years. Since 2018, mm -hmm. they've averaged almost 50 points a game. They've averaged uh, about 515 yards a game. And Mack and Tua, in the last three years, 131 touchdowns over almost just under 13,000 yards while completing over 72% of your passes. That's really rare. Right. So they've seen like almost perfection at the quarterback level. You probably won't see that consistently. Something we didn't really see before uh, in the early Saban era here, and they still want. So they'll probably get back to more of that. You'll probably see them only now winning by like 20 right. instead of winning by 30 and scoring 50 every game. Exactly. So the Alabama Crimson Tide will continue practice, and then they'll hold their 8A game coming up on April the 17th. So I'm sure a lot, a lot of Alabama fans will be excited to see what they bring to the table coming up this year. Meanwhile, we'll go to the other side of the state, and we'll talk to the Auburn Tigers coming up next. They held an open practice. It's something you haven't seen in a while down there on the Plains, and you'll hear from new offensive coordinator Mike Bobo coming up next. We're back here on Overtime on WOTM. Mark will flip gears, talk about the Auburn Tigers. They did something this past weekend that they haven't done since Tommy Tuberville was around before he became a United States senator. They held an mm -hmm. open practice, and, and this is a new coaching staff, obviously, with a, a whole bunch of new coaches that come from the Boise area. One retaining coach in Cadillac Williams who was coaching the running backs. Cadillac. And and Good running back, yeah. Exactly, and, and they're, they're now being a little bit more open than the Gus Malzahn era was, and holding an open practice and getting fans to come out, get excited about this program. I found this pretty interesting mm -hmm. and, and a different way to engage your fans to, a, to a, a group that they don't really know, number one. Secondly, this is a coaching staff that can't, do, can't go out and do a bunch of caravanning, a bunch of meeting and greeting because – they, because of all the COVID-19 restrictions. Right. So this is a good way to get people to know about your football team, but still try to do it in a good, safe way. I found it really interesting. Yeah, look, you, you want your fans to be able to feel like they have a closeness to you, whether you're a coach or whether you're a player, have access to your team. Maybe sometime, if you're Alabama, they're so good, they represent the elite. Maybe you don't think they're too good to get access to. Uh, but, you know, save as a normal guy, a, a, a very approachable guy. But I think with Auburn, that's something they can take advantage of because Auburn also represents excellence. They also play in the SEC. They also have done extremely well, well the last couple of years. Um, and I think with a new coach, that's something you want to institute. Mm -hmm. um, the new coach, new offense, kind of new energy around. I think it's a good, good thing that they, they've done. Exactly. With this new offense, it means also a, a new kind of style for Auburn. And the, some of the highlights you're seeing here, you're seeing them go the shotgun, and that's what most quarterbacks are used to. But Auburn did say today, and they, well, they've said really since they've installed this new offense with Mike Bobo, right. they'll do a lot of under center work. And, and going into this year, Bo Nix, from his high school days to his college days, he, he's had less than, I think, 30 yeah. under center snaps most in guys his career. Understand. And, yeah. and most, most don't. Do you, do you see Auburn being able to be successful completely changing up a scheme such as this. And it's not, you can still run the same things. I mean, like, right. let, let's just not talk about it like it's going to completely blow up your offense. But do you see Auburn still being able to have success, even though doing it kind of, quote, unquote, <laughs> in an unorthodox way, even though it kind of reminds people of, of the way people used to do it back in the day? Well, look, I, I think he had success when he was at Georgia, mm -hmm. okay, as their offensive coordinator from 2007 to 2013. They won two SEC East titles, okay? 
He uh, had guys like Matthew Stafford. Right. He had guys like Aaron Murray, who were very good quarterbacks in the SEC. Aaron Murray is one of the most underrated quarterbacks mm-hmm. in the SEC. Uh, even David Green was pretty good. These are all guys that learned under Mike Bobo. At Colorado State, they finished in the top two in total offense for the five years in the conference he was there. Generally, you're going to put up good offensive numbers with him. He's a little better suited for the SEC than he was out there for. You know, they just play no defense out there in Colorado State land. Exactly. So I, I think it would probably be, do a little better uh, being here uh, at Auburn. I think a lot of people are going to like to see what they're doing. Uh, if you're Knicks, last year you didn't really improve. You stayed almost the same that you did the year before. And they mm-hmm. lost some bad games, including to South Carolina, something they hadn't done since 1933. That can't happen anymore. They can't lose those types of games anymore. It's a definitely a new league and a new year, and we'll see how it runs with Brian Harson. Special thanks to our friends at AL.com for the video from over the weekend. Meanwhile, the offensive coordinator for the Auburn Tigers, Mike Bobo, talked about being going under center and what the change is for Bo Nix and these quarterbacks. He says it's not going to be as big as most people believe. Knock on wood, he's he's probably been the best at, at handling the center, center quarterback, and he's, and he's done good a job at that. Uh, we're not going to be primarily under center. We're not going to be primarily in the gun. We want to have a good mixture uh, of both, uh, you know. And it's not it's not that difficult. Uh, you know, you see guys going from college to the NFL all the time that may have been in gun their whole whole life, and go to the NFL and they've got to get under center. That's just what it's going to be. Something that's part of the Auburn offense is that we'll get under center, and those guys are going to have to learn how to do it. And you know, they're they're athletic kids. Uh, you know, you're basically doing a drop that or an executing a footwork under center that similar to what you did out of the gun. Uh, it's not that different. You might add, you know, some more steps to it because you're under center. So I don't see it being a big deal. It hasn't been a big deal. Now we've had some, you know, some center quarterback issues, but that's always happens uh, in spring ball, especially when you can't practice uh, before spring ball starts. And the first time they take uh, center quarterback exchange is when you go practice. Well, coming up next, we will honor the life of an NBA legend in our final segment. Closing segment here on Overtime. Mark, today we lost an NBA legend. Elgin Baylor passed away at the age of 86 years old. He's a a guy that obviously we weren't around to see him at the height of his playing days, but he was always one that was kind of in the consciousness of the NBA, had a very silky smooth game, obviously tied a lot to the city of Los Angeles, both with the Lakers and the Clippers. And I know the, the NBA family, uh, obviously devastated with this loss, died of natural causes mm-hmm. uh, in his home, surrounded by his family. So that's the good thing. But obviously a life that was well-lived and a basketball career that's memorable. Yeah, this is a guy who people thought uh, was the, the first really athletic player. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. J was his idol. Then he had Dr. J come along. Then he had Jordan come along. And then now you have LeBron James, what the game has become. But Baylor was really the first guy to do that. 61 points in the NBA playoff game, only M- Michael J- Jordan's 63-point performance is more than he did. Exactly, an unbelievable career, an 11-time All-Star, also a 10-time All-NBA selection, and was also named one of the NBA's 50 greatest players, Elgin Baylor, passing away today at the age of 86. Well, that's our show for this evening on Overtime. We'll be back tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you then.